Well, good evening, everyone. We are at Yellowstone Theological Institute, Bozeman, in Montana. We are live with a live audience here and live on Facebook. So if any of you know who I am, hello. <laughs> if you don't know who I am, you're about to know a little bit more. So uh, we're going to just jump right in here. We are going to be, uh, the title of tonight's lecture is um, Babette's Feast and the Cry of Every Artist's Heart. So. I don't know how familiar you are with Babette's Feast. Anyone here read it or seen the movie? It's mm -hmm. one of my favorites. I've not seen the movie um, because normally when I see a movie that's from a story that I really love, I end up not liking the film. So yeah. that's just generally, so I haven't seen it yet. At some point I will, but I love the short story. And so if you haven't read it, I've got a, a copy right there um, of it. It's by um, Isaac Daninson. She's Norwegian. Um, she used a man's name. Her real name is not Isaac Dennison. Yeah. It, that's Isaac Dennison. Yeah, yeah. It was easier to be published as a man than a woman. And so she published under a man's name. She is also the author of Out of Africa, which many people know mm. the film as well. So she's a brilliant writer. Um, and she's put her finger on a lot of things um, in this thing. So the title is Infinite Grace, which comes from the soliloquy um, that the general... Uh, does in the middle of the short story at the feast he does his toast um, and it's just a brilliant brilliant thing so um, we're going to go ahead and just read that um, to start us off so so this is setting this up um, Babette is a refugee she's from France the French Revolution is going on most of her family has been killed she has fled to Norway and she finds two sisters who live in this house together all by themselves and they have never been married um, although the story goes into their brief history of having failed love so they've not had this experience of love but they've regretted not being in love and so there's these they're basically spinsters that live in this old house and Babette comes to be their maid and uh, they don't really know who she is. She just happens to be a brilliant um, French chef, and they don't really know who she is. And so her father was the founder of a religious fundamentalist group. Um, and they met religiously while he was alive in small groups and um, had very, very strict um, way of thinking about worldly goods. They had no worldly goods. They didn't think beauty was of any importance whatsoever, so they dressed rather drably. Um, to eat anything that was fancy was considered to be sinful, so anything that you indulged in your senses was considered to be a bad thing. And so um, her, their, their father had passed away, and his, what would have been his hundredth birthday is rolling around, and they want to commemorate the old man because because the community is still gathering together they're still meeting although the community is dissolved into some pretty ugly stuff they basically argue all the time and they have all these disagreements with one another as good Christian folks tend to do <laughs> and so um, they decided they were going to have a, a celebration and Babette who has recently won the French lottery <laughs> interestingly enough comes up with a pretty large sum of money mm -hmm. and um, and she she asked the, the ladies if she can prepare the, the meal for the night um, and they reluctantly agreed to do this so she sends to France to have all these exotic things come into the home including a live turtle so a live mm -hmm. turtle shows up and it's brought up the port right and they are afraid, they are terrified. The women are afraid that she's a witch and that they're, they're gonna actually, she's casting a spell on them. Mm -hmm. And so there's all this backstory, although they don't dare say anything to dear Babette. They just talk about her behind her back. Right? <laughs> and so Babette has no idea. And so, you know, all these people are invited and the general is one of the sisters' um, former lovers that goes off and they get separated but he returns to visit his mother and he shows up to the feast and he's lived shall we say a pretty uh, adventurous life and uh, so he comes to the portion of the feast when their meals are coming out and all these like beautiful plates are coming he recognizes all of them the general does and he's telling all the guests how expensive and rare and they don't even know what they're eating 
<laughs> and it's elaborate. And he's telling them all these things about it. And so he stands up in the middle of the feast to give uh, this uh, toast. And this is what he says. This, by the way, in my opinion, is one of the best descriptions of grace I have ever read. Yeah. I've been to seminary. I've read hundreds of books. I've gone to seminars. I teach on grace. And when I read this, I thought, wow. Miss Dunson, she's got it. She nailed this thing. And I don't know where she got her understanding, but it really doesn't get much better than this. And so that's what I want to read tonight. Mercy and truth, my friends, have met together. Righteousness and bliss shall kiss one another. My man, my friends, is frail and foolish. We have all of us been told that grace is to be found in the universe, but in our human foolishness and short-sightedness, we imagine divine grace to be finite. For this reason, we tremble. We tremble before making our choice in life. And after, after having made it again, we tremble in fear of having chosen wrong. But the moment comes when our eyes are open and we see and realize that grace is infinite. Grace, my friends, demands nothing from us but that we shall await it with confidence and acknowledge it in gratitude. Grace, brothers, makes no conditions and singles out no one of us in particular. Grace takes us all to its bosom and proclaims general amnesty. See, that which we have chosen is given us, and that which we have refused is also at the same time granted us. I, that we, that which we have rejected is poured upon us abundantly, for mercy and truth have met together, and righteousness and bliss have kissed one another. I mean, that just that gives me chills, because that's just like, wow, that's, that's it. I mean, they, he's understood this deeply. And so it's with that kind of background of this story um, that I carry on with the rest of the story. So after the meal is finished, the cleanup's beginning. Beth, Beth is exhausted from two days of cooking, and she's in this kitchen, and she's cleaning up, and there are pots and pans everywhere. She's just cleaning up after this mess, and the sisters come in. <laughs> and the sisters try their best to thank Beth, Beth for this amazing meal, um, but they're worried that she spent all of her money, right? Because they found out how much it cost. She spent every bit of the, the lottery, 10,000 francs on this one meal. <laughs> and the sisters are like stunned. They're like, hey, they're almost angry about it. Like, why would you lavish this upon us? We've never been lavished on before. We actually think it's wrong to lavish on somebody and you're doing it to us. And you were gonna use this money to get out of here and go back to France. You could have lived on this money. Why would you waste it? And so here's the conversation. They say to the sisters, say to her, you ought not have given away all you had for our sakes. And Evette says, for your sake. No, for my own. I am a great artist. So you will be, so the sisters say, so you'll be poor your whole life. <laughs> Evette, poor? No, no. I shall never be poor. I told you I'm a great artist. A great artist is never poor. We have something which other people know nothing of. Through the world there goes one long cry from the heart of an artist, give me leave to do my utmost. Isn't that great? Mm. So that's, they're like, you're going to be poor, you're going to be poor. She's like, no, no, I can never be that. <laughs> okay, I can never be poor because I'm an artist. And so there's this cry that goes through the heart of every artist, and it is this. And this is kind of where I'm going to kind of tag off on what does this mean. <laughs> As a Christian artist, for me personally and for even as believers, we, we have a very classic um, devotional guide, right? That this harkens to when I first saw this. I was like, oh, this is kind of like my utmost for his highest, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is not a word that we use, right? We, don't, you, we should, okay? But that's just saying, through the world, there's this longing cry. There's, this, there's almost this ache that she has as an artist that, quite honestly, I feel it too. I feel sort of a weight of it. Um, burden is not quite right because it doesn't sort of hunch me over like, oh, I got to do this. Like it's chained me down. It's more like it's a longing, a desire, a deep um, desire to to do what God's called me to do as as an artist. Um, and I feel very rich because I'm an artist. I feel what she's saying about I don't. I'm not poor. Right now, my kids are out here trying to hawk all my wares. They're the <laughs> um, and it's always nice to sell work because when you sell work, you get to buy more materials. I mean, that's how this thing goes. My wife says it's got to pay for itself, right? And so that's it. But this is really 
the thing I'm asking. Just, just kind of leave me alone. <laughs> Give me permission, right? Grant this one request of me that I can just do my utmost, my best. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, Babette's asking that question, um, and so we're going to try to ask that ourselves. And here's three things that, quite frankly, I think is what it means for us as, as artists, as Christians, quite frankly. It's, it's across the board. Um, but when I talk to my, my Christian artist friends and even my, my artist friends who are not Christian, these things resonate. This is not a conversation that I couldn't have at any artist gathering anywhere. We talk about these things. Even my, my, my lost friends, even some of the artist friends I have who maybe are a little depraved in the sense that their art's pretty dark, right? They'll focus in on this one. Because right? that's why, the, you really want me to paint truth? Because it's pretty ugly. <laughs> yeah, I paid attention out there. I mean, that's what they tell me, right? But their truth is focused on just the truth of saying what they see. They don't have a perception yet of what is unseen. And part of the Christian artist world is to make the, the unseen world seen, visible. That's what the stuff out there in the hallway is all about. And we'll talk about that in a second. So truth, goodness, and beauty are, are transcendentals. Right? These are transcendent things. These are all things that belong to God. Right? And the reason we connect with them is because we connect with Him. And so we're like, this is who God is. Right? Um, that, then we have to kind of uh, grapple with, with this together. Um, a lot is being written on these these things. There is one particular fellow that I'm um, very fond of, and that's Peter Kreeft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I was told it's not Kreeft, um, but this is some quotes from him. And if you want to read some things, he's a, a Catholic philosopher at Boston College, um, and he is um, amazing, quite, quite frankly. He's very, very good. Um, and... Uh, has some beautiful things to say about just all three of these things. And um, Dr. Peter Kreef says that truth, goodness, and beauty are all three things we all need, and we need them absolutely, and we know we need them. Yeah. <laughs> Does it? I don't know about you, but this is really getting much better than that. Like I could spend all day like we know we need these things. This is why Bozeman has such a vibrant arts community. It's surrounded by beauty all around it. Like, people love to come here because you just walk. My kids are like, this is beautiful here. Yeah, right. And why do we even care? And why do we get in other places and we go, man, it's just, it's not very nice here. <laughs> we care about these things. We care about the color of our clothes. We care about what things look like. You have flowers in a vase out here. <laughs> why do we do these things? Because it matters to us because these things matter. Truth, goodness, and beauty and we know that we need them. And he goes on to say this. He goes, we never say, I have enough truth. We're never satisfied with it. We, we want all truth. We don't want some truth mixed with a little bit of lie. That's not what we desire. We want all the truth, all the time, forevermore. That's how human beings are wired. Same thing with goodness. We don't want goodness mixed with a little bit of meanness. We're not living in this like balance, like, oh, I'll take, you know, I'm willing to take a little bit of both. Right? No. Now we live with both, <laughs> but that's not what we really desire. We desire goodness. And beauty's perhaps the hardest of the three to get our hands and heads around. Aesthetics is uh, extremely uh, difficult issue to get our heads up. What is beauty? Is beauty purely in the eye of the beholder? Because that makes it all relative. Right? Because so we know that's not really right. <laughs> but what is what is beautiful? And I'll be talking um, in three weeks or two weeks from now, um, I'll be doing a lecture on, on theological aesthetics and trying to grapple yeah. with this idea of is God beautiful? And what does that mean for us as, as his people? So anyway, that's beautiful. So um, truth <clears throat> relates to the mind. Goodness relates to our will, the choices that we make. And beauty relates to the heart and the imagination. Okay, And so that's how these are all the three aspects of who we are. These really are the makeup of the soul. 
If I said my soul is my thinker, my feeler, and my chooser, that's how I talk to my kids about my soul. Right? I have a body that houses a soul, which houses my spirit. It's kind of this way that I think about things. Um, and truth relates to this aspect of how I think. I want to think correctly. Right? And goodness relates to the way I choose, how I live my life. It needs to be a good life. And beauty relates to how I feel about things, um, what stirs my heart, um, what stirs my imagination, and what can I do to create beauty um, in the world. Um, different cultures connect to different ones of these things, right? And I, I, I would just throw out one. The Japanese have perfected a, a whole culture around beauty. Yeah. <laughs> I've, the last four or five years I've been studying Japanese culture, and it's like, I heard Fujimura say that J Japan was at the end of the Silk Road. <laughs> so everything <laughs> flowed right to Japan, and when it got to Japan, it was refined. Oh. J Japanese people are the refiners, right? So for the last four years, the best pizza in the world by some people that judge these things is made in Japan. <laughs> like, how is this possible? Right? It's not. doesn't seem possible, but they've refined it. Think of automobiles. Right? They've, they've been refined there. So the Germans come up with this engineering. <laughs> Very much engineered thinking process. Everything is like this. And Good Americans, man, we've just made it very practical. The all we was pragmatic, we just you know do all that thing. And if you really want a beautiful stunning machine, you, you go the other route. So um, truth is good and beautiful. Goodness is true and beautiful, and beauty is true and good. <laughs> so they're all sort of interrelated together. Almost, and some of my artist friends and I dabble in this Trinitarian thought. <laughs> of this sort of being our, at least our trifecta. We sometimes use Trinity, and I don't know that that's the best way to think of it. But they, but they are seen as one is not more. You can't have one without the other. They're, they are, are interconnected. Um, and so that's some of what we have going on there. He goes on to say that truth, goodness, and beauty are called transcendentals, or the absolute universal properties of all reality. Now, if you're into philosophy, then you're going to have to unwrap that. Okay? <laughs> I've talked to my philosophy professor, um, Dr. Zach Manus, and he, he, he just sat down for 45 minutes and tried to explain this one sentence. Okay? I'm an artist. I'm not a real deep philosopher, but I do appreciate what they're saying here. And they are transcendental because everything in every category participates in them to some degree. So you take everything that we're dealing with, and they're, they're, they, have, they can plug in under one of these categories. So you are doing discipleship. We're doing equipping. It's falling in to one of these things. If we're engaging in the community, it's falling under one of these categories. Um, these are the only three things that we never get bored of and never will for all of eternity because they are the attributes of God, therefore, of all of God's creation. That's, like I said, you need to look at Peter Craig. He's, he's pretty amazing. Um, so, uh, I want to tie in a scripture here, um, not because I feel like I have to, but because I feel like it, it helps explain what we're doing. Because if we're talking about the essential characters of God and all these things being a part of His creation, then His Word should exonerate this. It should, it should say, oh, yeah, this is, this is how the Word's put together. Because we know that the Word of God is true. We know it's good. Right? The psalmist tells us it's good. It tastes good. Right? It looks good. It makes us, and it, we know it's beautiful. Right? We know that about the Word. So what does the Word say about some of the concepts that we're talking about? In this particular um, passage, um, in Isaiah 61, um, as most of you know, this is one of Jesus' first sermons. Like, he comes right out of the chute, like, grab and scroll. <laughs> He's like, yeah, 61, what? <laughs> pulls that out, reads this text, and then says to the people there, today this scripture is fulfilled in your midst. Oh, wow, I'd like to have been there at that. Well, because if I had been, I'd have probably been with everybody else, like, yeah, sure, who the heck do you think you are, right? Um, but I know, I know the story now. So I go back and I read it in there. And these people have longed for this to happen. And now Jesus is in their midst reading this. And so let's just kind of enjoy it together. And I'm going to tell you why it's significant to me. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, for the release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. Mm. The display of His beauty. Right? And we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But this section right here, all of it is beautiful. All of it is what we are to be about as God's people. Um, this, this is our utmost. This is it. This is why we do whatever we do. Um, and so this section right in here where he starts talking about grieving and mourning and crowns of beauty um, instead of ashes. And so part of my uh, artist journey is very much this transformation. Okay? Because um, that's a tr tremendous transformation that's taken place here. <laughs> right? You go from being covered in ashes and sackcloth weeping, wailing, mourning. Um, yeah, just a very, very intense kind of, this isn't just like, I woke up and I'm having a bad hair day, kind of like, oh, well, you know, I don't feel so good today. <laughs> this is like people scraping themselves, you know, not bathing for a long time. This is, this is not even depression. This is people very much in control of their situation, and they are just mourning over some deep loss in their life, personal or otherwise. And so they, there's this transformation that's taking where they're, instead of these ashes, they've been given a crown of beauty. Right? So instead of the oil of or the mourning, they get the oil of joy. So there's this huge transformation that's taking place. And so in my artwork, that's what I'm trying to do. Right? That's, that's really sort of this... Um, place that I'm working. So here's here's kind of, if you were to ask me, this is what I'm doing. Artistically, visually, right? Other people do it in other ways, but because I'm a visual artist, this is what I, this is how I connect. You could say the same thing for someone who's a poet, same thing say, for a singer, songwriter, composer, music, dancer, right? All these things, they're all doing some type of combination of moves, symbols, rhymes, rhythms, uh, notes, <laughs> whatever it is, they're coming together to do these things. So this is sort of my, my way of thinking about it. There's a beauty to be found in the midst of struggle, sorrow, tragedy, and questions. Visual artistry combines colors, forms, shapes, textures, shadows, highlights, and symbols with ideas, concepts, and metaphors. The effective combination of these two elements within a composition forces the viewer to consider, to think, and yes, even celebrate that all things are being woven together for good. Okay, so um, I'll just show you a couple pieces here and kind of talk to you about this. This one you'll have a chance to see. It's out there on the fireplace. <laughs> it's a 40 by 40 how I printed it. I can print it smaller or whatever. It's on cards out there. My daughter will be more than happy to sell one to you. <laughs> um, but this, and, and I have to tell you kind of the, how this works. So you, I want you to understand that there's been a transformation. This is not the, this is the end if you don't know the beginning. <laughs> okay? Because actually what this is, a, this is a photograph of my father-in-law's driveway in Arkansas, in Batesville, Arkansas. There's really nothing more common than a driveway of an 84-year-old man in baseball, Arkansas. That's pretty common. Um, and most people don't wander around taking pictures of them. Like I was out there one day <laughs> doing that, and my father-in-law, who already thinks I'm crazy, right? He's okay with me. He likes me all right. I provide for his daughter, and he loves me dearly, but he doesn't understand me completely. Like, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm taking pictures of your driveway. Well, why would you do that? I'm like, well... I have plans for this. Like, what are your plans? And then I try mistakenly to explain to him what I'm trying to do, and it makes it worse. Right? So then I just have to show him the end result. And so I, wait, I bring him to him and show him. He's like, that's not my driveway. I said, well, yeah, it is. And I take him out there, and I have the, I actually print it off so he can see it in color. And I show him, like, exactly where this expansion crack is. And finally he goes, yeah, I can kind of see that right now. What the transformation that's happened between this ordinary, common, mundane thing, 
call a driveway is that I add layers and layers of digital color on top of that. Most of them transparent. So one color is created by another layer and another layer and another layer. So I'm not just adding this rust color. That rust color is made by about 10 or 15 other colors that make that color. Now the unfortunate part about that is I can't make that color yet. Because I'm don't. i not patient enough to write everything down. Everything's pretty intuitive. <laughs> so as I'm working through the process, I know where I'm going. And once I get there, I can't backtrack it. <laughs> and that's, that's really unfortunate because there's some colors that I'm like, man, I need to, I want to do that color in this thing and I can't get there. And so I just, so I work with the limitation of what I have, what I've created for myself. And I've tried to like sit down at my little iPad and write it all down and it never turns out well. So I just go with this very fast flowing kind of a thing. Now it takes, you know, three or four hours to create something like that. Um, but anyway, this particular piece, which is called Infinite Grace, from the quote, um, is my story. It's my testimony. This is, this is my life, visually. Um, and so down here, in this segment of the, of the piece, is a, a section which is red and black, and very deep, rich colors, which to me represents the um, sacrifice of Christ, the suffering of Jesus, which really... All of my work has some reference point to that. Um, there's always um, some type of dark place in it. That's to be truthful, right? Because none of the other stuff happens without that. <laughs> so there's also a transformation that happens even in this very piece itself. It's being, it's being transformed. Obviously, you can see it moving up and outward. Okay, so this line right here with the gold and the white and the neon kind of colors in the middle sort of represents sort of my life, my lifeline. I've lived a life that's been pretty much, it's not been a ton of real big high moments, not a ton of lows. I've lived, I've just kind of bumped along, right? But somewhere in this process of life kind of bumping along, the glory and wonder which is God, which is the white and the gold, um, began to draw me. Our pastor was talking about that this morning, the drawing of the Spirit. I felt that God drawing me in. And at some point, I believe. <laughs> and that belief took this sacrifice of Christ and began to just infinitely pour out His grace in my life. Multiple, multiple ways. Uh, my salvation. <laughs> my identity in Jesus. Even, even the hard days, they're still dark up here. There's still splatters of things that I don't understand completely. There's some things up in here I don't quite frankly even like. Okay? But God is working it all in there together. Um, he's blessed me with an incredible family. My son, if you've met some of my children, I have hated them. So um, the four that you've met are my four adopted children. And so um, they're a blessing to me, and they come from really hard spots. You know, and some of this is hard. It's like, I've done easier things in my life, right? But it's what God's called us to do. And so, but all the identity in Christ's truth, all the things that I am, all the blessings and gifts and all, everything is just sort of exploded into this infinite kind of grace-filled background. So that's, that's that piece. That's, a, that's one of my favorites. It's a significant piece to me. Um, and again, it's, it, it's undergone a transformation, much like I have. Right? I'm the same way. I'm just a common, ordinary person from Southwest Missouri. Born in Arkansas, raised in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Right? You know, I went to school, did all, you know, there's nothing spectacular, right? But God has somehow enriched and moved in my life, and He's done something in my life. And He's continuing to do it. And I'm choosing to say, God, take this ability I have, whether it's doing painting or these photographs or whatever and use them to speak a message of your truth. I want to I I be a person who's filled with truth and goodness and beauty. And if my art can help do that, then that's what I want to do. So that's, that's infinite grace. Um, this one is called Mountain Where I Run, based on the line of one of those nice little praise songs, you know, Be the Mountain Where I Run, this safe place. The original photograph of this was actually a much much torn up sidewalk in Kansas City that I nearly broke my neck on. And so I took it as per a lawyer picture. <laughs> it actually made me fall down. I thought, what in the world? And I looked down, there's this sidewalk that was 
had some, this part was like lower down, this was like newer, you know, and it was just all tore up and it had a crack. And so I inverted the image, turned it into a negative, which meant the crack, which was black, is now white. And as soon as this one showed up on the screen, it's like, man, that's a lightning bolt hitting the mountain. <laughs> that's what everybody sees, right? And so um, got some nice Milky Way look. But if you look at this, you can still see the aggregate of the sidewalk, very much mm -hmm. part of that piece. And again, it's a transformation. It's a picture, right? It's something that was awful and most likely would be replaced and torn up and thrown away has now been changed and moved into something that's beautiful and sends what I think is an interesting message to people. So that's another piece. Um, this piece is, uh, Emmanuel, this was my Advent reflection from two years ago, or a year ago. Um, this is actually, I live on a 35 acre farm, this is actually, um, you come over our little meadow and you look down into the creek, it's about a 12 foot drop down there, and we had a really cold snap. Now I'm not going to tell anybody in Bozeman <laughs> it was cold because you guys know about cold, but it, our creek froze eight inches thick. Wow. And in Missouri, in southwest that's Missouri, cold. that's cold, mm -hmm. right? We call that cold. And so I looked down over this thing, there's this narrow kind of shallow area that the, somehow the oxygen got trapped in that ice, and I don't know how it did it, but made, it made thousands of little white specks all in this dark background. So the original photograph is basically that the frozen ice that this oxygen got trapped in. And I took it and I was working with the colors of Advent, which you can see there, the purples and the blues and the pinks. And, and then this, all this gold is just <coughs> my understanding of what it is that God's with us. Like He's all around it. Like He's in the dark spots and He's in the bright spots. Like, and so He's engaged in all of it. And whenever He's around, um, things are moving, things are changing. And so this has very much a feel for me. Uh, almost like a almost a tornado kind of effect. Like it feels like it's spinning. And again, just a, a transformation has taken place in, in color and texture and value and symbols, right? Because these are all the colors of symbol, right? We, if you know the Advent story, you go, oh, I know what that color means. That's the, can, you know, you understand gold is sort of this color of divinity and divine things. Mm. So that's my piece of you know, that. This is a, a piece of sidewalk right outside of our administration building at, on mm. SBU's campus. <laughs> Nothing any, incredibly special about it, um, but this is my color palette. Like if two people have picked any <coughs> two colors that you love the most, these are my two favorite colors, this deep rusty orange and kind of a blue and turquoise color. I mean, I can do, I just love that all the time. Um, now, interesting enough, I had this as an exhibit. It's actually out here being shown, and there's a guy that said, man, these kind of look like lifelines in your hands. No, I really never thought about it. But when I held my hand up, it is eerie how much that looks like my hand print. Um, and this I did for a friend who was going through a really difficult time. Um, and it's called a body club. Just that we, we always have a hope. This is where my, my art diverges from this um, negative kind of art where it's just like let's tell the bad story that human beings are terrible and wretched beasts and we're depraved and let's you know over just sexualize or whatever we're going to do we just kind of do this thing it's not very pleasant to be around you yeah. can't take your kids to it and it's because they left off hope if they're going to show depravity i can do that painting too right i mean i can show you that but i'm not just going to show you that and leave you there yeah. right there's somewhere to go that's just the launching point <laughs> So there is some more to go, and, um, and this piece is, um, <laughs> it's also, I hear it's the one hanging up in the, the little round corner because we couldn't make infinite grace fit in there, darn it. <laughs> um, but this is where they removed the carpet from SBU's student union a year ago, and these are the carpet residue. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever ripped up carpet and that mastic glue that's mm -hmm. down that you can never remove, that's it. <laughs> I told the guys, I said, you can't do anything here. Yeah. And I was there for an hour just taking pictures of different segments that they thought I was insane. They thought I was with the insurance or somebody like that. And, um, I said, no, I'm just going to turn it into art. But this piece um, is, is for God so loved. And uh, you can see sort of this 
sort of not hidden cross. It's there if you want to see it. It's not like it's not a cross piece to me because um, I don't try to do that. I'm sorry. I, I'm not trying to be Thomas Kincaid necessarily. That's not really my point. Is to like have a cross and an eagle and a flag and all of this obvious Christian symbols. But I but I will do that. But they're just sort of out here a little bit. Now this one uh, when I started putting the colors together, it just came up as this like almost world picture. It's like it's kind of crazy. So as I'm like doing my thing, it's like suddenly it's like, whoa, this looks like this cross like overlooking this world. Um, and so when I say, you know, for God's love the world, I don't think it just means me. I think it's the cosmos. He's, he's coming back to recreate the cosmos and make it all good. So I'll tell you a story about how this works. I was at an art show um, in Springfield, Arts Fest, one of the biggest ones in, in Springfield, and I was an exhibitor there. First time I'd ever done one of those. That's an experience doing an outside, outdoor art show. But I had all my work up. There's a fellow came in, and he really loved these pieces with uh, glue. I don't know why, but he was like really into it. He's like, you got any more of those? I said, yeah, I got, uh, I got three more. And so I showed him this one. He goes, well, what's it mean? Now, this guy is all oh, got tattoos all up and down his arms. I mean, he's been cursing all the, you know, he's just like doing his thing. And I'm just like, he's asking me this question, like, what does this mean? I said, well, okay, here's what it means. The title is, is For God So Loved. He's like, huh, he does? Like, this guy's asking me this question over this art piece. I said, yeah, I really believe he does. And I said, well, this is, you know, I'm telling you what the symbols are. He said, you got any more? I pulled out one from a bin, pulled it out, and it's my reflection on the transfiguration of Jesus. <laughs> He's like, what does transfigured mean? I said, it means to be changed. Jesus was changed. Well, changed from what to what? I said, well, he was changed from being this like human presence, and he was, God glorified him, showed people who he really was. <laughs> and it was just like mesmerized. Wow, I should see because it's gold and it kind of has a spinning thing. And on one side, it's kind of black and white, and on the other side, it's like this fiery prophet's kind of. So I told him the whole story, like the whole thing. Like Moses went up there, and then Moses came down, and, and then I was told that Jesus was coming to do, be the prophet, fulfiller of the law, die on the cross. He's like, oh, that's cool. Really like got another one. So I took him to my reflection on a, Isaiah called uh, um, "All Things New." He's like, what does that mean? I said, one day I'm going to make it all new. And I said, you know what's crazy? I said, all this work in here that you're saying is all about transformation. He makes us all new. This guy's like, I have never had anybody talk to me about God like that before. Thanks. And he walked out of the booth. <laughs> Truth, goodness, and beauty. So he was drawn. Mm -hmm. by the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. And I got to tell him the truth about it. And we shared a good moment that in any other context would not have been nearly as good. The art made it happen. Okay? And I think it can do that uh, for sure. Um, just a couple of other things here. Um, for me to do my utmost means that I do not simply have the task of integrating my faith with my art, but rather I allow my art to spring forth from my faith. I'm not trying to take two things like oil and water and put them together. Art and faith, they go together. Matter of fact, they are integrated. We just need to recognize the integration of it and go with it and let the, what we do, um, whatever um, medium that is, and let it come from within us. And if it comes from within us, guess what? It's filled with faith. Mm -hmm. It's already integrated because the Spirit's already done it. Mm -hmm. See, the Spirit's really already the artist within me. Mm -hmm. These are just these are just his hands and vessels that he uses, the mind that he uses, the way that I see color that other people don't. Right? But that's that's what I'm saying. Hey, you can take that. And I'm just going to give you this. I'm going to give you a picture of sidewalk and let's see what we can do together with it. And so I wanted to do that. Jesus says that whoever drinks the water 
that I give to him will never thirst again. The water will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And for that kind of creativity to bubble to the surface, we must be drinking deeply mm. from his living water and be deeply connected to the vine. Okay? So this stuff is all about connection. Many of these things are my devotions, especially when I paint. I'm going to be doing some painting while I'm here. I don't get to paint a lot because painting takes time. Painting takes time to get it all out and put it all away. Mm -hmm. When you don't have a studio, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm working on that. See, I'd work on the kitchen table, right? And I got four kids. You don't leave it out on the kitchen table, it won't be there the next day, right? So I started doing photographs on my, on my stuff. Because I can do it, I can work on it for 20 minutes, save it, and it's put away. It's closed left. <laughs> I just move on. And I can pick it up and it's right where I started. So I started doing these things out of creative necessity. Because mm. makers make. Creators right. create. Well, you can't stop us. If you say, well, I don't have time to paint. I'm going to be picking up, I'm going to be doodling, I'm going to be doing something all the time. And so the Lord let me stumble upon this. Right? It started with the ice storm that we had, and I was like, oh, these are really pretty ice crystals. Aren't they neat? I didn't know you could change their colors. When I saw you could change their colors, it was all over. Because mm -hmm. then I just started taking pictures of all kinds of crazy stuff. All right? So, our utmost good, our best art must be rooted in the soil of honesty. We must see the human condition as far worse than we think. And God's grace as more infinite than we can even imagine. Our utmost good... Our best art must work tireless to redeem and reclaim beauty. A redeemed beauty will reconnect us to goodness, truth, and righteousness or justice. And my students really appreciate when I say that. My students are very socially conscious. They want, to be, they want the world to be better. Um, they haven't really connected that, there's, um, that sin is worse than what they can even think and that God's grace is infinitely better. Mm -hmm. They haven't quite made all that connection, but... Um, that we are working toward that. Um, Beauty from Ashes, every one of these pieces started as a photograph, you already know that. Um, yeah, these things are, I've already been through this, but I want to do a little bit of a paraphrase for you because I think this is really true. As fallen creatures, creating under God, Living in a broken world, we cannot ignore the flaws, but as new creations in Christ, we must declare boldly, creative, artistically, that all things are made new, yes, even beautiful. That God is indeed working all things together for the beautiful. <laughs> right? Because the good is beautiful and true. So I want to read one more text, and then I'm going to um, see if you guys might have any questions. But Philippians, Paul does this wonderful thing in the sort of the um, exhortation at the end of Philippians, which I really have grown to appreciate. Um, you know, as you're a young man, you kind of get in these narrow places where you think God is only talking about the one sin that you're doing, right? <laughs> and that there's this whole bigger story that's happening. And when you get older, you're like, oh, I really see that for what it is. This is one of those texts for me. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, ding, we just talked about that. And whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. <laughs> Whoa. And that's why I have these pieces, some of them in my office. Like you are in my office and I have some, <laughs> some mm -hmm. really wild ones in there. Because every day I come in, I'm like, I have to know that God, you're with me. God, you're true. And God, you're, there's hope. Right? I have to know that. Because if I don't know that those things are true and I'm not surrounded by those, and yes, quite honestly, I have to be reminded. Mm. <laughs> and visually, it reminds me. Right? Sometimes I'm sitting there with a student and I have this exchange with them and it reminds me because I, there they are. I've just heard them have a transformation in their life. Um, so so that's, that's that. And then... I believe that all things are collaborating together for beauty and truth and goodness. And so this is kind of what we are um, what we are supposed to be about. So I don't know if you guys may have any questions uh, about that. Um, anybody out there on Facebook, I've talked for about 40 minutes. That's pretty good.
anybody here? This is not it's not off topic, but it's a it's a question to kind of keep provoking us. So Psalm twenty seven four. Mm -hmm. Probably one of my favorite verses, mm -hmm. obviously. We share mm -hmm. by that. And mm -hmm. the one thing I long for, the one thing I seek is to be in the temple of the Lord so I can gaze upon different translations, but beauty is the best one. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you see that? This kind of things we've talked about is kind of part of that, that we are we're we're aesthetic at our heart in many ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's the most uh, direct inference to beauty. However, <laughs> the Hebrew understanding of glory is all about aesthetics. Yeah. All, all about it. Now, interesting enough, for Hebrew, the aesthetic was tied to character. Character first, appearance later. So when they would say that the splendor of the Lord or the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah of God, whatever words, there are several there that are used. It's really saying the character of God is beautiful. right? But he has absorbed in transferring his character outwardly so that we would even say that he is. So for the for, for see the Western, we think like aesthetically is only the outward. Only the, Historically, I haven't cared that much about the inward. Like, as long as something is beautiful, I don't care what it means. Or it's like, it's yeah. nice to be beautiful. If the person's beautiful, we don't care how they act. Let's be beautiful. Right? But for the, Esther was beautiful, right? She was beautiful to the king of Persia, who was not lost as he could be. He wasn't even part of the Jewish covenant, but she was part of the Jewish covenant. People they considered to be beautiful because she had beautiful character. Right? That was the first thing. And all through that book, you'll see her character show up. Right. And it was her beauty that got noticed, right? So that's what we have to try to do. We have to say, what can we do to attract someone to notice the beautiful thing we do so we can tell them the truth of what we do? And that, that to me, is whatever discipline you're in. Um, and I'm not afraid to explain what I'm doing in my work. I know some artists are like, well, you just whatever you want it to be, let it be. And I'm just really not one of those people. So my titles are pretty implicit. If you were to go to my um, Instagram account, every one of them is titled, uh, often with a uh, scripture verse and something there. I'm not afraid to do that. Um, interestingly enough, there's a new app out called uh, D Empty Space, and it's basically a virtual gallery. They've created this app on your phone that you can go in and create gallery walls and you can scale your work to make it look like they're huge, <laughs> which mm. I wish I could do that. <laughs> and so I got onto this web, or joined the app. Well, the people that are founders of it, they're from Korea, and they're all Korean, and so they emailed me and said, man, we really like your work, and we would like to do an interview with you to do on our blog to advertise our, our app. I'm like, sure. <laughs> and then the guy, so I said, sure, and he goes, well, I have so-and-so get in touch with you. They're our writer and all this kind of stuff. And, and, he, and here's what he said. He goes, we perceive that you're a very religious person. And we really want you to talk about that. Okay. Wow. Okay. So last Monday, this gal who is from South Africa, we were Skyping together. And for one and a half hours, she's asking me questions. And 70% of the questions were about faith. <laughs> now, awesome. what, now what did it? Pictures of my father-in-law's driveway. Right? And so, I think that's what... Now, I understand the limitations of what I'm doing. Right? Mm -hmm. This is a reflecting tool. This is not... I'm not making icons here. Right? I'm not... These are to be worshipped. These are not God. Right? They're not that. They are not the gospel. Right? They're just a tool. Right? They're just like a soccer camp. Or any other thing that we might do to how can we draw people in so we can create a relationship where we share the gospel? Start a conversation. Yeah. And I can start conversations here. Mm -hmm. You know? Now there's some people that they so you know, they don't, they don't care about our art. They just don't. Like they, they're just not wired that way. But man, when I sit with artists. They are deeply wondering, like, what's your symbol? What's your process? I mean, if you ever just see artists together, they're just, they're always asking that question. What do you mean? What you're doing? What you're thinking? What you, 
what's, what's going on in here? <laughs> um, what's your concept? And I always want to know. So I just have this beautiful metaphor. I'm talking about transformation, transformation, transfiguration, changing, my, you know, all these things. And people resonate with it. And so it's been, been a really exciting thing to be a part of. Um, but absolutely, that's what we're, what we're doing is we're saying that the, the Lord is beautiful and we are using beauty um, to honor Him. And I'll talk more about that in this next, the next one. Next week I will be talking about Great Commissioned Art, which will be talking about um, the temple and the tabernacle. Uh, Thirteen chapters in the Bible spent on God saying, this is to the artist, the ladies, Bezalel. Here's what I want you to do. Why don't you make this to talk about a picky customer? Like most of my people that commission work with me, they're like, hey, you just do what you want to do and I'll love it, right? <laughs> but I occasionally will have somebody that comes out, I want these kinds of colors and I want this and I want that. And they lay out four or five restrictions for me, which I'm having to work with. But man, God lays it out, boom, 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 down to the inch, and he expects it to be right. right? <laughs> well, I, can you see it where he, he tells them this is the laundry list of stuff you're supposed to use? And he, so Bezalel turns to his assistant and says, where do I find porpoise skins in the desert? You know, what does that mean? Yeah, there, there's, there's that. And the interesting thing is, is about 80% of what they used to build a tabernacle came from Egypt. Yeah. From their bondage. They brought it with them. Listen to the beauty in that. From your bondage and your slavery, mm -hmm. you're going to escape with your very lives and go where you don't really even know what's happening, but you're just going to take all this stuff and you're going to go out here and I'm using it. I already know what you got. I'm the one that made you an impulse to grab it off the wall when you took off with it. It's, it's, it's quite fascinating and extremely difficult materials to work with. Oh my goodness, yeah. So we'll talk more about that and the implications of that um, next week, and then the one after that will be more of a theological aesthetics kind of look. So, hey, you know, just offhand, since you brought uh, Peter Craig into this, have you read any of Von Balthasar's work? Mm -hmm. The first volume of Glory of the Lord. Mm -hmm. This idea of aesthesis, that the form and splendor of Christ, right? Jesus mm -hmm. is is this this aesthesis, this this perceptive. So it's the form and splendor together. So the splendor being the spirit radiate, radiating out of his humanness that, that uh, you know, aesthesis uh, is our ability to perceive it then. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're drawn in as, through this aesthetic. Mm -hmm. We're drawn in. And um, I, I did a paper on this once. And I, I said, you know, most Christian theology today is actually anesthetic. It puts us to sleep, mm -hmm. as opposed to drawing us into mm -hmm. who Christ is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, that's I think that's a that's a game changer. Yeah, which is which is the whole beauty of the transfiguration. Mm -hmm. This is my favorite story of it. It didn't used to be, but now I love it because I I, I kind of see what God Almighty was trying to do. I'm I'm, I'm wanting you to see Him for what He really is. You think you know, mm. and you say that he's the Son of God, but you're kind of on the hem of the garment. And I'm just going to strip all that off, and you're going to see. <laughs> and when you see that, it's like his face shone like the sun. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what that does when I look at the sun? It, that's so, it's blinding. There is no way to describe that. It's too intense. Um... And it was such an amazing experience, and, and I always see it as being filled with, with, with movement and wonder, almost like this giant tornado kind of a whirlwind kind of thing that, that mm. a lot of things around Jesus were also being transfigured. I might be stretching that a bit. But, it, but, it, but I think that if, if Jesus were trans, coming in here and transfigured, there would be dust coming off, and, and it would all of a sudden be caught up in it, and dirt and rocks would be flying around, and glass and everything else would all of a sudden be reflecting Him. Because it's part of the cosmos, so it would be reflecting His glory. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a wild artist's view of it. So when I painted, that's how I painted kind of this wild scene. They were, they were terrified. 
They were terrified. They had not seen this part of Jesus. When it was all over, people were like, whoa, it was really good to be here. I'm not sure what we just saw, but it was really good to be here. So let's stay up here because that's a really cool thing you're doing there. Everybody needs to see that. And then what Christ would say is, yeah, then go feed my sheep because they need to see that in you. I want to do that in you. Isn't that great? Yeah. That he wants to be transfigured in us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we have. We have this aesthetic, you know, this anesthesia that's putting us to sleep. We are like, you know, we need to let that Jesus in us sort of like go, just be transfigured in there. Yeah. Let the law be what it is and the prophets in my own life be what they are. But let them stand amazed in what you are and be transformed and be transfigured because that's what he says to me. Romans 12, be transformed. It's the same word. It's crazy. It's like we could just as easily say, and be transfigured. It's the same word. It's this metamorphosis. It's changing. Something's changed. And we need to let that. I'm always amused by uh, contemporary, or just worship music, period. Hymns, contemporary, whatever. But um, generally, today we do very much of we're giving glory. But there's some of the old things that still strike me. So, I stand amazed in the presence, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, and and these other ones that really acknowledge those incredible biblical truths. What does that you know mean, and what does it how does it you know transform us? Yeah, I have a couple of pieces out here that are sort of hymn reflections. Um, the one that you asked about with the Green Bay Packer colors, you asked about that really wasn't, but I can see what, where you're going with that. <laughs> um, is it you know He hideth my soul. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's this, this picture that a friend sent me from Athens. It's an ancient wall, and he sent it to me because he knew that those I like really weird concrete-looking stuff. So he sends it to me, but it has this really weird black crevice. You can see it out here. It's kind of this, and I always think, that's why the God just carved out this spot. I'm going to put you in here. I'm hiding you in the cleft of this rock so I can pass by. Because if I don't do that, you'll, you, you'll perish. I'm protecting you by not letting you see me. You'll still see a part of me. So the outside of the image is very bright and vibrant and all these colors, but there's this there's this notch cut up in the middle of it. it kind of looks like it's been carved out with a hand, this kind of a man stuck in there. So you have to check it out. And the other one is uh, um, it's called Foundations. It's based on the how how firm a foundation. Because I've really come to, to understand, you know, that there's a foundation we're built on and, and it's firm and solid. And then all the other realities that are built on on that. that. That hymn is fantastic. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. So I'm kind of working through a lot of hymns these days. Um, thinking about it. I've got an artist friend who's a, he does more contemporary um, hymns and we're actually talking about maybe doing a visual hymn. Mm. So he's going to do this renditions of old hymns and I might do these kind of visual reflections. On it, so it'd be an interesting project for sure. I hope I hope it happens. Well, I th that would be cool. I, th I think that there there are some groups that would actually produce the packaged stuff, but it's always just like uh, videos of rolling waves already. But yeah. it's, it's not really anything that, that totally piques your imaginative query. It, mm -hmm. it just kind of says, oh, I get it. There's yeah. waves there. So yeah. it's it's two one on one well, correspondence as it's opposed okay. to. And what I'm going to do in my workshops, and maybe you guys can come, I, I, even if you're not artists, you can come, oh, yeah. come because I'm going to be spending a few moments in my painting workshop on abstraction. Like, what is abstraction? Because it's really important. I do that. I didn't always do that. I can do the other. And I used to like, I used to do pen and ink drawings, if you can imagine. Like, so this is very detailed, very meticulous, very realistic. It's like I've kind of swung over here to this other side. And I'll tell you why. Because, and we'll talk about this in that workshop is if we were going to, say, paint grace, how do you paint that realistically? Like, what realistic image do you paint? Yeah. Okay, we can say, well, Jesus died on the cross. That's great. Okay, that's cool. Um, Jesus being kind to a child, that'd be great. I mean, we're, we're just really limited, because we don't even really understand what the concept means, much less like what a real life, like, there it is. There's the picture. We see hundreds, if not thousands, of pictures of grace through the through the scriptures. Okay? And so then I start asking people, what well, do you know maybe what color grace might be? When I start doing that sort of asking those kind of questions, it's amazing the colors people ascribe to grace. 
It's pretty interesting to know. Each one will have one. Like, do you see an image of what they, what you think for you grace looks like? Like I showed you mine. It's kind of what grace looks like to me. Is it going to be what it looks like for everybody? No. It's not really the point. Right? But because we all sort of visually already see things, right? And so, um, what color is hope? Right? What color is, you know, and some things we already have colors associated with. So if I said sacrifice, what color is sacrifice? Mostly red, right? Sure, right? Yeah. Um, very deep reds, right? And of course, right? Glory would be gold, right? Uh, something pure would be like white silver, something along those lines. Um, despair would be grays, black, right? Um, heavy colors. Um, the spirit, what color would the spirit be? This is always an interesting one to me. People, I always ask that. What color is the spirit? Anybody? This is when, you, when you say spirit, what, do you think of a color? See, I, I don't. I mean, I, I first go to the bird. I go to a dove. Yeah, sure. You know, I go to that, that's, which would be white, but it's really, maybe. white is not, it's just colorless, I think. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe blue. See, I go yeah. with blue. I go with blues, and I go with a wide variety of blues. And sometimes I even throw purple, because I like purple. Yeah. yeah. Just a little bit of purple goes a long way, cause I, even though I'm from SBU. Blue, uh, <laughs> are, is blue part of the, the sense of the, the fluidness of the well, spirit see, that flows like water and springs it, up? I mean, and that's exactly uh, the question, is it? No. It is to you. Yeah. Right? But it also makes me think of wind, for some reason. Well. Because the I look fluid. up at the clouds, I see the sky's yeah, yeah. blue, and I know the wind is moving, yeah. right? And so, but but always the spirit is always dynamic. Yeah. So whenever I try to do that, kind of color that, it's a very vibrant movie. It's not very static, kind of a thing. Um, when I when I when I paint, try to paint the father. Like if I do a symbol of the father, it has to use a lot of gold, a lot of gold leaf, a lot of that sort of thing. But it tends to be very Mm. Solid. Mm -hmm. right, very solid. But it's interesting, his spirit I see is very fluid. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's that's but that's how I see it. Right? And a lot of people see that and some people don't, but other people see but my point in talking about abstraction in that way is that people see different things in different ways. Okay. Well it's, it's if we go back to, to John four and the woman of the well, for example. This, the contrast between this is a cistern and, and well up like springs of living water. Yes. When I think cistern, the Oklahoma boy, and he says, ah, dark, mucky, I can see mosquitoes breeding in it, whatever. Springs of living water to me is blue and gorgeous, and you can just drink it right. Yeah. Just, you know, yeah. and, and so spirit would be yeah. the living very, water. Very much that old mm -hmm. song we used to sing, spring up below, gush, 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 gush. I mean, yeah. that's sort of that Russian kind of a thing. I, I did a painting for my daughter-in-law. Um, called uh, Water from the Rock, which is that reference out of Corinthians that refers back to the wilderness experience yeah. where you, know, you get the rock and the water gush forth. And it's a very, very moving kind of thing. It's got a very earth tone kind of quality at the bottom, and it's all done with minerals. This is one of those minerals paints, and then I did the blues with Ooh. an azurite blue, and then topped it all with splashes of oyster shell. Ooh. So it's a very, and it's crazy. Oh, yeah. Speaking of metaphors, there's an interesting, even the materials I'm using. Oh, yeah. Okay. Every single material has to be crushed. And from the crushing, there comes beauty. I, I've appreciated all of your visual imagery, but if I gave you my life first, then you would understand why Babbitt's feast spoke to me of God's mm -hmm. grace. My, my life verse is, O oh, taste and see that the Lord oh, is wow, good. Yeah. So I live with a whole different set of, yeah. of yeah. The, the, the imagery for me yeah. is, is a different sense. It's yeah, the sure. taste. Yeah. And Babbitt's Feast just communicated that in the beginning. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. Know, you asked me what color is grace? I have no idea. But I can imagine some <laughs> of the taste <laughs> that, that grace would be. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for starting with Babbitt's oh, yeah. Feast. I love that story. Ready to call it a night, brother? Yeah, we'll call it a night. All right. Thanks, brother. Amen. Amen. Exciting stuff. Well, since we're all, since we're the leadership consortium here, y'all will figure it out tomorrow. They've got. We got it. They got it, and I've updated <laughs> Amy. Bill's gonna pick up.
Kim, go to their house. They're getting the ice tonight. They know what's happening, what shoes to wear. They've got food. They know where they're eating dinner. We're good. Did I wrap up enough details for you? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thanks for being here.